Mountain Bluff, and I really thank you for being here. It's impressive that it, it possibly was the mayor's years that has brought all the politicians to our doorstep, but we're thrilled. Um, I understand you had a very productive meeting with town, with my husband and the mayor's ears, and I thank you for that. Um, but my question, I wanted to sort of move off the landscape, which is so important to so many of us here, and just to ask you about the Congress in general. Um, we've watched I've watched, I'll speak for myself, I've watched the, the current administration take apart, dismantle so many things. I would like you to comment on something positive that Congress is doing on either immigration, health care, or climate change, instead of just hearing what we can't do or we're not doing. Thank you. Um, can I take a little liberty uh, with your question and expand a little bit some of the good things that we're doing? Uh, and I love the question, and thank you, because I want you to know that if not careful, a lot of my life is negative, right? I just spend a lot of time in a really negative environment, and so I try to put a positive spin um, on things. And a couple of things I want to tell you about that were not on your list, and then I'll, I'll try to address your list. Let me go back to this opioid legislation for just a minute. It's a huge problem in our country. And um, when we were in the majority as Republicans, one of, the, one of the things that we got to do was preside on the House floor. And they would pass that uh, around. They would delegate that to different members. And so one evening, I had the chance to preside on the House floor. And can you imagine how cool that is? You've seen the State of the Union with the big flag back there. And there I am up there, right? Who would have ever guessed? Uh, not my mom. <laughs> and um, we were debating these opioid bills. And the Republicans, would, the debate went something like this. The Republicans would stand up and say, and we had to debate all 67 one at a time. Republicans stood up and said something along the lines of, these are really good bills. We've worked hard on these. And we'd like to thank our Democratic colleagues for their help on these bills. We hope you'll support the bill. And then they sat down. And the Democrats stood up and said, these are good bills. We've worked really hard with our Republican colleagues on these bills. We hope you'll support the bill. 67 of these bills went through with near unanimous support. And then over to the Senate and then signed into to law by the President. Uh, here's my question. Have you read anything about that? Right? And that's the problem. We do a terrible job ourselves about talking about what we do well. And, um, and you get to hear all the things we don't do well. Uh, another one I would just point out very quickly is justice reform. Um, we didn't get all the way done. As a matter of fact, they called it, uh, uh, Jake, they called it first, first Step Act. First step kind of acknowledging that there needs to be more done. But we did some really critical work on justice reform this year, and that passed on a highly bipartisan basis. The third thing I would tell you before I hop into your specifics is um, I learned that there's something in the House of Representatives called a suspension bill. A suspension bill is a parliamentary, parliamentary procedure which says if you want to move your, your bill up quicker in the line to get a vote, you can do that if you're willing to agree to a two-thirds majority vote, which basically means it has to be bipartisan. Okay, did you know that 80% of the bills we pass go through on suspension. 80% of the bills we vote on go through on suspension. Now, we are dysfunctional. And one of the reasons I have kind of put your specifics off for a minute is because a couple of them that you mentioned, especially immigration, is one where we are highly dysfunctional. And um, in my 15 months, I've had these highs and lows on immigration because there were a couple of times when it seemed like both sides were coming together. And I can give you a real specific. Many, many, uh, of the, particularly Democrats, would like to see us solve the dreamers' problem and, and see that as a real problem. Um, they are not very um, anxious to, um, I'm going to be careful here, support a barrier, right, a wall, right? Is that a fair statement? Many, many Republicans are quite anxious uh, to support a barrier slash wall, but haven't been highly supportive of the dreamers. And they both want what they want so much that they actually started talking to each other. And if you can imagine these two groups like this, they actually did this and came together and said, look, I'll support you on yours if you support us on ours. The rest of us said, yes, and we quickly put together a bill, 
got it up to the floor for a vote, and the night before, guess what they did? They did that again, and the vote failed. And then we took it up again in a slightly different vote, uh, form, and, and, it, and it failed. I've seen us uh, try to tackle immigration in, in one big, massive bill that would be massive reform, uh, and that failed. I've seen us tackle bites and pieces of it, and that failed. Um, I personally co-sponsored some of these bills, I voted for them. If I had a magic wand, I would love to see us do massive immigration reform. There are so many broken pieces, it's hard to pick one. Um, but uh, let me just give you one really good example of a broken piece that we don't talk about as much. We have a program for highly skilled workers here in the United States where people can come over here on what's called a highly skilled visa. Many of these people have been in our country decades. They've now had children that were born in the United States. That works really well unless you're from either India or China. The reason why is we have caps on how many of those people can apply for green cards a year. And so um, if you are from India or China, it would take you as many as 70 years uh, to get that. Um, and you would think we could fix that, right? And we haven't been able to fix even that. That bill had like 150 co-sponsors, and, and we couldn't fix that. Um, I'm optimistic. It will be uh, interesting to see now with the Democrats in control of the House. I do expect to see something like a Dreamer bill come before us that's not tied to other things, and we'll see if, if that can pass. And um, I, I, I don't mind telling you and admitting that um, this is one issue that does get caught in political agendas. Uh, I wish. A couple weeks ago when we were into the shutdown and, and the president wanted so desperately his 5.7 billion, I wish that we would have used that as a point to say, okay, you can have your 5.7 billion, but we want, right? And I think they could have named them almost anything, right? Um, but that didn't fall apart. So we haven't made a lot of progress on that. I will tell you, we are starting to have more and more discussions about the climate. Um, this is a really interesting uh, topic. I believe Republicans have, have really failed in articulating that we do care about the environment. Um, we don't do a good job about talking about it in the Republican Party. And I want you to know, I think Utahns of all stripes, all, it, both Republicans, Democrats, Independents, really do care um, about the earth. And we're, I think we're conflicted about what to do about it. Um, but I think they care. And I've taken this as kind of a personal challenge to figure out how to help Utah have a voice on uh, environmental issues. One of the things that I'm really proud of, if you're really bored one night and want to Google Provo Clean Air Toolkit, you will see um, what we put together in the city of Provo. And in essence, what it does is it breaks down into groups, everything from individuals to families to churches to schools to government, and it lists what they can do to improve air quality in Utah. And that actually gives them some things that are attainable, right? Does that make sense? Um, and really proud of that. And, and heard the other day that there's actually gonna be a statewide version of that come out that will give us kind of all a template of, of what we can do uh, towards that. Um, I had a, a really interesting conversation with the chair. Well, he used to be the chair, now he's called the ranking member because when you switch from majority to minority, that's the title change. And uh, he's, he's the ranking member of a committee called Energy and Commerce. It's a committee that would specifically deal with climate issues. And, he's, and he kind of had the same conversation with me about how, as, as Republicans, we've, we've dropped the ball in articulating and, and defining a message. And he said, you know, we got together, and are you all going to be shocked? In this Republican group, there was not one climate science denier in, in this group of congressmen. Not one. The question is, what do we do about it? Right? And actually, I think that's a pretty good step for us to get to that point. And he articulated these points that he wanted the committee to, to, to pursue. And I added one to it. The one I added to it was education. He had innovation, preparation, conservation, and adaptation. And um, the, the thought is, look, there's a lot we need to be doing with innovation on this. There's a lot we need to be doing with conservation. There's a lot we need to be doing, in my opinion, education. I have found with Utahns, the more they're educated and understand the impact of their actions, the more willing they are to change, 
those actions. I'll give you a really quick example. The little plastic bags we get at the grocery store. Really, it only takes explaining to somebody you know, how difficult those are in landfills, and, and you do a much better job about using other bags. But a lot of that's simply education. I'm taking much longer to answer your question, but I, I, I really had some strong feelings about it. You have one more category. Uh, uh, oh, health care. Health 